floor is yours. Welcome, Cesar. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Alejandro. And, and for me, it's a pleasure to always talk about our specials and also deep learning. So, so it's, it's uh, okay. So can you see my screen? Uh, I don't know, is, is it clear? Perfect, right? So yeah, uh, as uh, Alejandro said, my name is Cesar. And today I will talk to you a bit about how to construct data set for, for deep learning and how can you do it in R? I, I think R have a lot of potential on, on it and no, not too much people is using it. And so I just want to give you a glimpse about uh, how powerful can R be for, for this specific task. So uh, I just gonna start with this plot, um, this figure that probably you saw it many times on the internet. And I think show clearly my point that data is quite important for, for, for data analysis in general, right? Because there is a really interesting relation, positive relation about the amount of data and the performance, right? And in other words, means that the more data that you have, the more performance you will obtain with uh, your model. And these special characteristics is principally related to deep, learn deep learning models. And you can also show it in certain way with machine learning and statistically modeling, but it's more often that you can see this this special really this you know positive relation with deep learning models. And and what is the problem with this uh, right now that we can observe in your observation in general is I think this is a all kind of old paper, but I, it more or less proved my point that every year we have a kind of exponential exponential you know growing in model size. If you can see the you know a bit of literature review of any task in remote sensing and ear observation, you can observe that every year the models are kind of big, bigger uh, in comparison to the previous year. And also, thankfully, we also have more computational power, right? We, we have more powerful GPUs every year. And this is a kind of constant uh, increase every year, but we cannot say the same for the data size, for the data sets that we use for training this model almost man are the same that we got five or four years ago. And just to give you an example, in cloud detection, for instance, you know, cloud det I, I decided to use cloud detection because it's a it's a task that I know very well because I was working on, on it many, many years. And also because it's quite important, probably if you have been working with satellite images, you have to face this problem, right? If you are when you try to create an, an image composite or, or you are trying to to do a kind of time series analysis to analyze the landscape, you probably have to first remove this uh, this cloud because it's a kind of degradation um, of the quality of the image. When you know in remote sensing, probably if you are a climate scientist, clouds are more are kind of your friends, but for for us are very evil because they degrade our analysis, right? So we always try to scream them out. This is more or less what I try to say. Then you could expect that. The data set for do these tasks are very big because you know it's a critical pre-processing step. But if you observe the data sets that we currently have in for Sentinel-2 at least, you can observe a clearly geographical bias. And also every point just represents one image. So we don't have too much data for train these complex models from deep learning that we currently have, like transformers models or diffusion models, something or these foundational models that are trained on billions of images. Here, we only have, I don't know, hundreds of, in the best scenario, we only have hundreds of, of data for, for training, right? But these big models that are quite popular right now in computer vision usually are terabytes uh, and terabytes of, of data for training. And that is a, a, a very important problem because like since, since uh, for this geographical bias, it also is gonna hamper a lot of the results if you go, if you move out of Europe or these, you know, high altitude areas, because, and this is more or less why it's explained why this kind of algorithms, at least in cloud detection, doesn't work really well for the Andes or all the tropical uh, rainforests, right? So what we did just to show you a clear example, and this is a, a word that I, I, I was very involved with, is in create a, a large data set. So what we did uh, one year, not, I think not one year ago, I think just four or five months ago, is we released a data set called Clocks and 1-2 with that 
extremely um, extremely surpassed the previous size of 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 the of the uh, data set for close detection in Sentinel two in. And we have this hypothesis: what is going to happen with the performance of the models? And we we observe that we we don't change nothing. You know, if we we use a very very lightweight model. It was just a unit with a simple encoder, and we were able to surpass the state of the art. We and the magic to do this was not create bigger models, was not use more GPU, was just increase the quality and the quantity of the data. So. I, I just introduced this just to show you how important uh, it is uh, the data sets. And I think we have to, to, to put a bit more of effort and not concentrate all of effort in just training this, this fancy neural network, but also try to create better strategies to, to create data sets. And um, yeah, this is um, what I'm gonna try to present you. And something quite interesting is for create this huge data set, it's clocks and want to have around one terabyte of data, but you know, we, we have to download around 10 terabytes because we was cleaning a lot of, uh, you know, the raw data set was around 10 terabytes, but final data set was one terabyte. Uh, but um, all this preprocessing or all the pipeline for create the data set was do it entirely in R. I think this is not very, a common because more often you can find pipeline for clean data in Python. And I think Python is very great. I love Python. I use it very, I use it uh, in my daily basis um, because I'm more involved right now in training neural networks. But uh, although Python is, is good for this general purpose programming that's, um, you know, that is behind this Python, you, you have a very great machine learning and deep learning support, what is great. You can also connect Python with, you know, if you are working with Spark or Hadoop, or you are trying to create um, applications, you, you have more options in Python, right? You have fast API, you have class, you have the Django. So it's, it's, nice, to, it's nice to create MVP pro, uh, products. But I think Python, one of the reasons why in close went to, we, we, we decide to do it in R is because Python, um, in my opinion, lacks a lot in this spatial data analysis. And this is something that R uh, shine, and it has a lot of different options. And, and But I'm not trying to tell you that is it worth it to, to use R rather than Python. That I think the best that you can do right now is try to learn bots. And also, if you start something in R and you at the middle of you know, of, of this implementation, you need Python for some stuff, but it can also, uh, also happen when you are trying to, to create a data set or whenever that you are doing, it, it's something that can happen. You can use reticulate is you, to code Python in, in, uh, from within R. And the same you can do it, on, but vice versa, if you are using Python and you want to use R, you can use this RP2 um, uh, to package. So, but, um. These packages are, uh, you know, works as a way of bridge, but um, they are not sale phase because you can often find also some, some errors in this integration. So at the end, you will have to decide which is the one that permit you coding, coding fast. At least this is what I always try to choose when I have to select uh, if I wanna implement something in R or if Python is how much time it's gonna take me. And I think for create data sets for the spatial analysis thing that I mentioned it, I think R is, is a bit more worth it than, than Python. And this is the reason why R I, I consider it is very, very stable for the uh, spatial analysis because you have so many different options. And I really like how R works because uh, in R we have a kind of set of packages with spatial classes that work as a foundation, right? So, and based on this foundation, these special classes like SF and Start and Terra mainly, all the different packages are developed. So this is something very, very nice because it's like all the community, probably the community is not very few as in Python, but it's like, I, I, I feel that there are more order, uh, you know, uh, the, um, Something very great as well is that documentation is quite clear. And I, this is something that permits me uh, to do stuff in just two, three lines of codes. And probably if, if I doing this in Python, as I'm gonna show you in the demo, 
probably it's gonna take you too much time to to do the same. So, um, yeah, you have in, in R just to mention you have packages to download satellite image uh, like R stack or RGE. Uh, you can also find it some similar packages in Python, uh, and, and you have packages for make cartography, visualization for spatial data modeling. Like uh, you know, if you are doing geostatistics, uh, you can use GSTAT. I think it's a package with more than ten years of history. I think yeah, it's very very stable. I I, I really love uh, how you can manage tables. Um, I forgot to put it here, but the package that I usually use is data tables. That is very very nice. And also the most important, and I think what I at, at the end decide to still use in R is for for these kind of packages like spat start. You have landscape metrics and you have RS, R, a remote sensing toolbox that permit you also perform the post processing, the validation of your model really, really fast. You know, with just two, three lines of code, and you, you, you can have very robust, um, you can run very robust statistics to see if your model is good or not. Uh, you have more packages and you can uh, visit this uh, CRAN. There is a CRAN page uh, that shows you all the different packages for a spatial analysis that exists in R. And there are so many. This is just a, just a, you know, the most important probably, but there are others according to, uh, uh, according to your task. Probably you can find some others more interested. So this is more or less the pipeline that I, I if someone told me, you know, implement um. Uh, a pipeline uh, from from scratch to train our neural network, and there is not a data set uh, constructed. Probably, I will start just using R to download and prepare the data. And once I prepare the data, I will then move to Python to train the model. Because I think I, I'm not gonna lie you, <laughs> maybe, but uh, Python just for train, uh, just to do anything related to linear algebra, probably using NumPy or if you are trying to train a neural network using PyTorch or TensorFlow, I think is, is quite much easy to do it in, in Python. So yeah, that is the thing. It's, it, the idea is not to, to decide which one to use. I think you can easily combine them because uh, they are easily uh, independent, right? To create a data set and train a model doesn't need to be in the same, in the same language. And this is more or less what I do. I train the model in Python. And once the model is trained in Python, I move back to, Py, to R to validate my results. So yeah, and then and then probably the deployment is is more you know probably is in Docker with C plus plus yeah yeah but it's something not not relevant I think for this so uh, yeah uh, just to show you my point I I prepare a demo it's a very simple demo it's just um it's just to train a neural network uh, for perform the atmospheric corrections. And uh, the atmospheric correction for people that is not um, familiar with this um, with this task is um, when we are you know, taking satellite images, um, we basically take the top of atmosphere's uh, reflecting values uh, that is no more than the surface reflecting values plus you know, the reflected values from the atmosphere, right? But we are not interested when we are working with remote sensing. Yeah, not, not always, we are not interested in, in the condition of, uh, the, of the atmosphere and uh, more very, very often we are we are trying to remove this, um, this interference. So what is the atmospheric correction is, it means is try to simulate the atmospheres. And once we simulate it, we can remove the, the reflectance that came from the atmosphere. So in that way, we are gonna obtain the surface reflectance or bottom of atmosphere. So the atmospheric correction is a process to obtain the bottom of atmosphere or surface reflectance values. Um, uh, and yeah, and for do that we have to remove the atmospheres, the atmospheres, uh, you know, reflectance that can, you know, the reflectance that came from the atmosphere. That is more or less the idea. So um, as you can observe, it's a simple image to image problem, right? Because the input gonna be my top of atmospheres and my and, and my output is gonna be my eye gonna be my bottom of atmosphere values. So uh, the good thing is like both data set currently exist in Google Earth Engine and also in, in other you know data entry points. But I'm gonna use Google Earth Engine just because yeah it, I think it's easier to to download data from there. Um, but yeah, 
but the data for bottom of, um, of period currently exists and you can ask ask uh, you can maybe thinking on why we we need to estimate the bottom of atmosphere why we have to perform atmospheric correction if the data you know is currently available uh, in google rng but the 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 truth is like this data is available yes but not all the all the data set as you can observe the data here start from 2015 but uh, that it's um you know uh, you, we have data from level 1c i mean the top of atmosphere from this year but for BOA or bottom of atmosphere, we only have data from 2017. So we are losing kind of two years. And also I, I know that not all the images uh, are, are available. Uh, so probably you will observe that with level 1C, you have more data than in this other data set with level 2A. So this is why can be a reason to, to, to try to perform the atmospheric correction and also uh, just to finish this part is like here is running the center core algorithm that is a is try to simulate the atmosphere using a physical based uh, model and it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard and also slow if you are trying to run center core for for any specific image because yeah I probably have to mention this but you know a sentinel 2 image is around 10,000 by 10,000 uh, pixels and if you want to, but probably you are not interested in the full scene, you are only interested in a very specific area. So with send to core, you only have one option. If you want to atmospherically correct the, the image, you will have to run it in all the, the scene, right? And it only can, and it's only possible to use CPU for run this. So this is the reason why just to process in one image, it takes you around 20 minutes. So it's a lot of time, uh, it, it, especially if you are trying to perform this at national national scale or you know, at continental scale, it can be a nightmare. So if we are trying to sim, so the idea here is like use a deep learning model to try to simulate Centricore because in that way, we are gonna be able to run uh, this model in every patch. And also we are gonna be able to add GPU support. So it means that, we are going to be able to get results fast, quite much faster. So that is the reason why performance atmospherically correction can be worded uh, with deep learning. And this is more or less the pipeline. I'm going to use the same pipeline that they use that I used to for create plus and one two. I will download the data from Google Earth Engine with RGE. Then I will pre-process in all these data sets using our special ecosystem. And once I do that, I will create a memory map. A memory map is um is how uh, we are gonna see it. It should never use it, but it's a way to store the data very in a very efficient way. Then we are gonna train a model using Python lining in Python, and then I will move back. Uh, to our special ecosystem, and I will show you how you can flow this very, very, uh, very, you know, you know it's, it's not very complicated uh, to, to merge Python and R, so don't worry, you should never do it before. So yeah, this is um, this is the demo that I prepared, and I will start um, all the codes. Uh, I will share it uh, probably later, and just uh, Alejandro tell me where we are going to be the best place to put the code to because it's, it's reproducible, you don't need, you, if you install all these libraries, you will be able to, 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 to run these experiments. Okay, so I, I will start uh, with this line. Is this EE initialize um, is um, just to connect uh, Google Earth Engine um, uh, with ARC. Um, you, will, you will need probably, yes, you will need a, a, an, account, an account with Google Earth Engine, but if you don't have an, don't worry because if you if you just need to sign up and I think it takes around one day to to obtain your credential. But once you have it, and once you have it, you can just run this line of code and it's gonna work. Probably is is it if it is the first time that you will run this line of code, they will ask you for for some for put some tokens and credential. But yeah, it's I think it's not very very complicated. So. Um, I'm not gonna use, you know, in Clots and Quantum we work in a global scale, but uh, since this is a demo, I just gonna run this experiment in a very specific region, and that is Arequipa. And Arequipa is a um, is a region in my country, Peru. So if you don't know where exactly it is, don't worry because 
In R, we have this package called MapView that permits you in one single line of code, and you just have to run MapView and run and put the, the geometry. I will explain a bit what is this. But, um, but you can easily, you know, create a base map that will show you where exactly is Arequipa and this this uh and this is this area right uh, so yeah um okay so what we are doing here so basically this line of code what is is doing is like Arequipa shed file uh actually live uh, inside the RGE package is the geometry that we choose to create the examples in you know in the example section of RGE we always use this this shed file and when you install RGE, it is this RGE patient file is installed on your computer. So this ST read it permits you to to read or to load uh, any uh, you know you, it just uh, GDL in the back end to to read all the different format for for spatial data. So yeah, so and ST transform probably you if you are familiar with PostGIS, you probably recognize this prefix because it's. It's exactly the same that post is right? The names and, and all these different functions that I'm using here came from this simple feature of our SF package that permits you basically you know, read um, and ma manipulate the spatial data uh, uh, from, from R. So yeah, transform is what it's doing is changing the, the um, uh, coordinate reference systems for for this one. This is the UTM coordinate reference system for Arequipa. So yeah, this is the only thing that is happening here. We are passing from uh, W uh, GS eighty four to this uh, UTM um, system, right? So yeah, now that we we define our study area, uh, we have to create a, a sampling, right? Because we are not gonna download and the entire image for for Arequipa. What we are gonna do here for training our neural network is first we have to perform a kind of sampling strategy that will permit us, um, you know, have a representative data set for our study area. So I'm gonna create some points, and then to download the images, I will just create a you know a kernel um, that will permit me to to download. Um, to download the information, you know, because we 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 have to download the top of atmosphere and the bottom of atmosphere for for train our neural network, right? So we have to perform this uh, spatial sampling, and you have many many different. Uh, you can follow different strategies for do this, and and I think the most often is perform random sampling, but this is not a good idea. Um, I I saw it many times, but I always try to suggest that it's not a good idea because. When you are performing random sampling, it's very, very uh, possible that two points are very close to each other. So imagine that one point is in training and the other one is in testing in certain when you are biased, biased your, your results, right? So, and also the idea of creating a sampling point strategy is try to make your data set as much diverse as possible. So you always are trying, at least you always have to try in my opinion, right? I always have to try to, to avoid that two points are close to each other because this is, yeah, it's not worth it, I think, for, unless for deep learning. So you have follow, as I mentioned, different types of strategies, um, but uh, the one that I use for clock and one two is the hardcore point process. And I, I don't know if you just said before, but it's just a random sampling strategy as, as it's, it's random, it's, but, um, the difference with, with a simple random strategy is like it adds an, uh, an extra constraint that is uh, you, you can set a minimum distance. Um, that this is why it's called hardcore point because this minimum distance is referred as a hardcore distance. So you are trying to do something random, but you are you have a constraint that set a minimum distance between the points. So this is more or less what we are looking when, when we are creating you know, a strategy for, for sampling. And I don't know how, how 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 much familiar are you with this, but um, um, for do this, you have to create a, a GIF a point process model modeling, right? And this GIF point processing modeling have two parameters, beta and R. And it's very, very quite simple to understand because this beta is a parameter that 
um, show you the interactions between the points. And these are represent the, the hardcore distance or the minimum distance. So you, uh, I put this number here because it means that we are setting that the minimum distance between the between the difference point that we are going to try to find is is twenty is twenty kilometers, right? So yeah, it, depending of your task, you can define you know a, a bigger or a or a lower distance to for for, for perform this spatial sampling. So the next point, the next step. So we define the parameters. The, are just these two parameters, and then we have to define the model. You can do this with um, with all these functions come from this stats stats library. So you can create a, a simple model for perform this hardcore sampling processing. You have to pass the parameters. The you have to pass the regions. In this case, is our keep a shed file. And then you put the, the model that you are, are trying to optimize, at least the hardcore ones. And the final step is just you know solving this um, this problem, right? And I, we are gonna use uh, this Metropolis hasting processing because uh, is I think this is uh, um, is it possible to obtain the obtain the exact solution for this problem? But it's probably it's gonna run forever or it's gonna take a lot of times because it's a very Large area, Arequipa is, is, is a very, very large area. So I, I think it's, it's better to, to use in these cases, um, you know, kind of um, approximations for this. And the Metropolis hosting is very, it's an MCMC. I, I probably you have been working with Bayesian statistics, you are a bit familiar with this, but it basically performs iterative steps and and random sampling to try to approximate this uh, the solution for this problem that we we set here. So yeah, that's all. And you you just have to pass the model and you you put a setting, you know, a seed to initialize initialize the process. And after that, uh, you will obtain the results. And yeah, and that's all. And again, I'm gonna run this map view and to to see more or less the results. And I will compare it with random sampling because you you. And this uh, ST sample when you don't pass any parameter, this this function comes from SF that permit uh, that permit you run um, random sampling. So uh, what I got, I'm doing here is compare the result with this strategy uh, with the random sampling with that, to, to 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 show you how different they are. So this is more or less what I mentioned you as you can observe when you are running random sampling is very often to to get points that are close, very close to each other. But when you run this um, this hardcore distance strategy, you will obtain something like this that probably, uh, as you can observe, it will have a better, it will give you a more representative uh, distribution of points in your study area. And this looks like uh, a bit as an as, you know um, equal grid or uh, grid sampling, but it's not because uh, it's like they said you said that distance uh the distance constraint and and after this distance constraint the process is start to be um to be randomly this is why is you you know in grid search probably you will if you do a rec, uh, you know a horizontal line the point should be here but this is not what you are gonna you are not gonna observe in this type of uh, sampling but yeah this, this is more or less um what i told you that with r you can do this kind of uh, complex things in just three lines of code and i think with python you can do something similar um although i i was not able to find this hardcore uh, modeling processing with pysal um pysal is a great library i use it also many times but i i think with uh, yeah in my experience i, I think with the facts that you will have a more diverse of of modeling for a special a special partner. So so yeah, this is this is more or less how you can find a point for create your data sets. And once you have your have and once you define these points, you can start downloading the data. So I will just give you to explain you how to download the data. I will set this as one and I will you know I start to download in an iterative way because um, I create this function download image and the only thing that you have to pass to this function is is one point. So you was downloaded the data point by point. So let's let's see what uh, this um, 
a data image function does. So the first thing that this function does is, you know, this um this geometry is at at the local side, right? It's in your computer, but we are going to use Google or Engine for download this, this information. So you will have to pass this information from local to the server side, to, to, the, to the Google or Engine um, server side, right? So in R to, to perform this is quite simple because you only have to use SF that as EE. So with this uh, function, you can easily pass uh, any different uh, simple feature object uh, uh, from from R to Google R engine in this case, right? So in that in this in, with this function, so we convert this. This is in well-known text. Probably you, you have been working with well-known text. So if you just to show you that this is uh, well-known text, as you can observe. So we are passing this well-known text uh, to Google R engine. So that is a kind of more JSON, uh, GeoJSON uh, based uh, object, right? So yeah, this is how we pass this point to, to the server side. And then since uh, we have to download the data, we are uh, we have this um, data set. You know, I, I don't know how, how familiar are you with Google Earth Engine, but in Google Earth, Google Earth Engine have, a, have a, a data set called Air Engine Data Catalog. And in this Air Engine Data Catalog, maybe I think it should be more there um, to show you. This is a, um, yes. to let you know that maybe five minutes if you want to ah, okay. have some QA, okay. but no so, worries, no worries. So, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, this is more uh, the idea. So we basically is, is scrapping the data for our study area with a finite time and with a finite cloud. So we filter the, the images that are too much uh, too much cloudy. So this is what we do in this in this line of code. This is just the syntax, it's just the API of Google Engine. So probably if you want to perform something like this, you will have to learn the API because yeah, this is probably, it's, it's not a question of R, it's a question to, you know, it also, if you are using Python, you probably will have to learn, you will have to learn as well the API from Google Engine. So all this, this line of codes are, are very important because, um, Sometimes when you are downloading data, you know uh, you have the center of the pixel, but your um, your your sampling sampled point can be here, right? And so what this line of code does is basically using the geo transfer, uh, it will move this sampling point from you know from this uh, from this position to the center of the pixel. In that way, we are kind of fixing the this uh, spatial misalignment in at sub at two pixel level that can happen between the points that you sample it, sampling with the with the original geo transfer of the image, and, and this is very very important to have to to ensure that the um, the image patches image patches are constants in in your data set. So yeah, that is the, the idea. I hope it is half clear. But if you have questions, we can discuss a bit more about this. And then yeah, we just download. And one of the good things about Google Earth Engine in, in R is like if you want to download the data, once you identify and you define a kernel, you only have to run use, you can only use EE as RAS or EE as raster, and the data will start being downloaded automatically. So yeah, so this is why this line of code does. And I I will put it, I will change the name of, of the folder because probably gonna to take too much time to, to download the data, but I want to show you that the data start to be start to oops, start to be downloaded. Um, so yeah, uh, as you can observe here, yeah, the data, you know, it will start to download point by point. And this data will be saved in this folder here. So yeah. So if you just yeah, copy this uh, image. You will observe that um, you know you will um, you have the image downloaded, right? And you have eight bands because we have four bands for for training and four bands for for you know it, this is the X and Y we put I put just in the in the same tensor. So yeah, that is uh, how you can easily more or less create a data set and you know this. These images um, are the points that we sampling with R. So it will start to download and download. I just, I just put 100, but you can put 10,000 or the number that you want. So just 
the the only problem thing is like it can take days or or weeks to download depending if you're working at global scale probably it's going to take one week or two weeks to to download a good uh, sampling of of points uh, but um yeah once you download the data you can you can move to python i, I just want to show you really fast this um so yeah i just create here i i, I just going to share the code with you, but basically what this code does is use Google Air, um, sorry, it use um, Python lining to train a model. I, 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 this is not, nothing fancy, it's a very, very common pipeline for, for training neural networks. So you, you create, first I create a, a memory map, then I, you create a data loader. I think if you train neural network with Python, you will recognize this, ta this task. I create a simple CNN, you know, it's just, um, it's just one convolutional neural network. Uh, I create this uh, lining um, lining um, template because Python lining is just a way to use uh, PyTorch, but with a more friendly template to you know with classes to to make the process uh, you know a bit more easy to read. I, I think it it made you your life easier because. Um, Training neural networks sometimes it can be you you have to debug into much and Python lining makes make it easier. So yeah, you you can easily train a neural network. Um, you will start to train. I just put um one hundred epochs and you know the data set is just one one hundred images. This is the reason why the model trains so fast. And yeah, my computer start to make some noise, so it means that it's learning something. But uh, yeah, I just want to show you. Uh, I will stop. Um, um after show you something uh, after show you how you can connect this with google with r again because once you train your model uh one way to you know to convert this python python's python model because everything here is happening in python but imagine that you are trying to move this train it model into another different device you can easily do this creating a torch script model so a torch script permits you that is like permit you Compile your coding, your uh, trained model um, from from Python to any other devices. Like you know, can be cell phones, can be a server, and so on. So that is, and you can do it very very simple. That just running this line of code that is your git trace, and yeah, and in that way you will be able to save your model. And once you save your model, your trained model, you can go back to to R. And for instance, if you want to make a prediction, you only have to call uh, a geotiff image. Uh, you can, oops, um, what? Ah, sorry, I, because I in Python, I I have to switch here to, to move to to move to to R. So you you can define a, an image and your model train it, and you can call this using reticulate. I I not show you this, but with reticulate you can. If you want to use reticulate in Python in in R, it's very very simple. You only have to to run import and put torch here, and that's all. It's um it's the same that do import and um, import blah 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 numpy for instance in Python right, but in in R is with functions and this function the name is import is the same name. So once you load the model, you can I create this function predict that may permit you you know, make a predictions uh, using this model. Um, and yeah, I will I will stop here, but um, just to let you know, this prediction is quite simple. It's using NumPy internally and and the model to make the prediction and then save it uh, back to, to, to start. And yeah, and then and since that the model is now in, in R, you can start to, you know, run using the other libraries to, to perform some post-processing analysis. So it, that is the idea. I, I just wanna finish with this now. Uh, it's like, you can connect easily Python and R using this reticulate, reticulate library and you know have the best of both, uh, both words in the same in the same script. And so yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is, I have to rush a bit, but I hope that the idea was clear and I don't know if, if you have some question, I will be very, very happy to answer them. Thank you.